It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Carl Hess, press editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Donald C. Cook, chairman of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Mr. Cook, of course, as chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, you've been sort of a watchdog of public investment in Washington. And tonight, I'm sure that our viewers would like some financial advice from you, sir. Now, first of all, we had on our program recently Mr. Lasser, the income tax expert, and he made the statement that it is very difficult now for Americans to accumulate anything out of income. Uh, is that your view, sir? Is that correct? Yes, that, uh, that is correct. Well, in order to accumulate anything now, the average American family has to invest wisely. Isn't that correct? That, I that is correct. And one of the ways in which they can invest is by investing in, in stocks. Now, uh, that well, how many people have taken this, uh, <coughs> this course so far? Well, I would judge that uh, there are in the United States as many as uh, nine million holders of uh, securities. Well, is that, a, is that a large number comparatively? Yes, that would be, I would think, a very large number. Certainly in comparison with uh, uh, other countries of the world, including the, the European countries, where there, uh, of course, are great numbers of investors, uh, uh, it's, it's a very large number. Well, is it large in comparison with, with our capital, with the vast amount of uh, industry there is to invest in? Uh, what about the diffusion of this? Well, I would think that uh, in a country of 150 million people, uh, of which there may be as many as uh, uh, 60 million uh, heads of households uh, and uh, uh, varying degrees of, uh, of wealth, that to get 9 million holders is a very substantial amount, although I would feel that there is still room for uh, an even uh, greater diffusion well, that's of uh, security holdings in the country. That's an interesting point, Mr. Cook. Uh, uh, you, you, do you think that it would be good for our country if more and more people own stocks? Oh, yes. I, uh, I very definitely do. You what? know, uh, when you're a stockholder, you, uh, you have a share in the profits of uh, American enterprise. Well, buying stocks is still uh, speculative, isn't it? Well, their speculation will never be completely eliminated because all speculation means is that you're assuming certain risks which uh, are necessarily inherent uh, in, a, uh, in a commitment. Well, how do you people try to make these risks less? Well, I think we have made them uh, very substantially less. We try to do it in two ways, principally. One way is to ensure that the business is honest. In other words, eliminate all of the fraudulent and manipulative practices to the fullest possible extent. Have you done that? Uh... Well, we have uh, eliminated a great many of them, but of course, uh, uh, I suppose they never will be eliminated 100%. Uh, you mean there's still a lot of Sharpies around the country trying to yes, peddle things? Yes, yes. Uh, I suppose even while we're sitting here someplace in the country, uh, uh, fraudulent uh, activities in the securities field are, are going on. Well, well, sir, is it possible today to, uh, for these big uh, operators, these crooks like from the past, such as a Ponzi operation, these large-scale fleecing of the public. Is that possible now? Well, I would think the large-scale uh, fleecing operations, as you put it, are, uh, are well-nigh impossible. 
Although I, I think I would be less than frank if I didn't say that probably all over the country there are little miniature uh, Ponzi <laughs> schemes going on uh, all the time. And there's still plenty of suckers in our country, I assume. Yes, uh, Barnum said, uh, of course, that there was one born every minute, but with uh, the advent of large-scale production in this country, I think now we have about one a second. <laughs> <laughs> Could you give our viewers an illustration of the type of thing that you've, you've halted in that category? Sir? Yes, I, I think I, uh, I could tell you about a, briefly about a little case. It didn't involve a large amount of money, but uh, because of the, uh, the extravagant character of the representations that were made, uh, perhaps it might be of some interest. It could affect anyone. It could affect anyone. Uh, and did affect uh, these particular people to the tune of about $100,000. Uh, the case I refer to is one in which uh, uh, some individuals uh, promoted a company which they represented as having very extensive uh, uh, coal and timber rights in Canada. And in approaching prospective investors, they told quite a Baron Munchausen story, and it went something like this. They told investors that uh, uh, one of their associates had been instrumental in unearthing fraudulent claims against the government during World War II and had reported that fact to President Roosevelt, who was very uh, grateful and therefore uh, uh, presumably interested in this individual's uh, welfare. They also indicated that the Canadian government was uh, 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 very grateful for the assistance which the United States had given to it during the last war, and that uh, they were therefore successful in getting a concession in British Columbia uh, uh, of something over 10,000 acres of land. And they would have the right to take the minerals out and, and take all the they timber out and so on. And, and that story was actually believed by a number of Americans. That investors. story was believed by a great number of Americans who went so far is as it, to invest $100,000 in it. Is it fair to say, sir, that uh, a good many of the fraudulent schemes have come out of Canada from into this country in the last few years? Oh, yes, many of them have. Why is that? Why Canada? That's Well, uh, I think the principal reason is that with... Uh, uh, more rigorous enforcement activities in the United States, uh, the possibility of having it happen here was minimized. Mm -hmm. In addition, we did not have what is called an extradition treaty with to Canada. To bring people back. To bring people back here to try them for security frauds. Well, now, ha has that situation been remedied? Within the last year, we were successful in getting a treaty with Canada which has recently been signed and is now in effect. To could bring the people back. Yes. Uh, Mr. Cook, could you give our viewers uh, a simple rule of thumb by which they could recognize uh, fraudulent operators in Stockfield? Well, of course, there, there are no completely satisfactory rules, but I think there are some guides. One, I would say, is always beware of promises of a high return. The facts of investment life are such that, uh, except in the most unusual cases, yields are inclined to be modest and representations of high yields uh, most likely to be false. Secondly, when you buy securities, it isn't like buying something that you can see and look at and hold. Uh, you're buying a piece of paper, and trust and confidence plays a, a large part in it. Therefore, don't buy from strangers. Mm. Well, well, sir, <coughs> now, you have been a, a Democrat, and you are now, and you are still in office under the new administration. Now, our, our viewers will recall that, that this regulatory function, is, uh, the S SEC, was brought into being in the last 20 years under the New Deal and Fair Deal administrations. Now, sir, do you think that any attempt will be made by the Republican administration 
to change uh, the Securities Exchange Commission? I really don't think so. I don't believe that any of the statutes administered by the Commission will be repealed or substantially modified. I don't believe that any of the policies of the Commission will be substantially changed. I feel that this administration has just as much real interest in the welfare of American investors as any administration uh, we've ever had since the uh, uh, inception of the Commission. So you don't, you don't think that there will be, there's not going to be any attempt to, by these big businessmen that we now have in Washington, there's not going to be an attempt on their part uh, to, to change the, the Commission, basically. Well, all, all forecasts are dangerous, but uh, as I've indicated, in my judgment, I don't believe that any such attempt will be made. Now, sir, as, as a final question, You've mentioned that there are nine million Americans who now own stocks. Uh, do you believe that, that that number will increase in the next few years? I think it will increase and I think it should increase. I think that if more people own securities in the United States and have an interest in the profits of American business, that we will be getting a real bulwark for our free, democratic, capitalistic system which all of us want to preserve. Well, thank you very much for being with us this evening, sir. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Carl Hess. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Donald C. Cook, Chairman of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Giving a Longine watch is almost like selecting a watch made to your own special order because the Longine watches your jeweler offers you are chosen literally from hundreds of new and exclusive styles and models each year. Now this has always been a Longine policy because we realize that those who buy Longine watches expect such exclusiveness. Above and beyond faultless performance, above and beyond unparalleled accuracy, a Longines watch offers pride of possession, for a Longines is in fact the world's most honored watch, the only one of the world's finest watches to win so many honors for excellence, elegance, and accuracy at world's fairs and international competitions and in observatory accuracy contests. For Easter, for an anniversary, for a birthday, for any important gift occasion, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, the television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines with Nor Watch. This Sunday night, Alan Young proves it's time to smile on the CBS television network.